Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 741 of the podcast. And it is Thursday, the 7th of March, 2024, as I record this early, as I am off to 20 Books Sevilla in the south of Spain. So in today's show, I have an interview with Becca Syme about dealing with change in the indie author community, shifting business models and how to navigate the splintering of options, as well as dealing with how fast things are changing with generative AI and some practical ways to stay resilient. And also why we are both intending to stick around and help surf this wave of change in the author community. Now, Becca is always great to talk to, so that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing industry news, Kobo launches Kobo Plus in Ireland and South Africa, which is two more countries where readers and listeners can use the subscription programme to try new authors. And remember, the best part for us is that you don't have to be exclusive to take part. So as I've said many times, I think subscription programmes are fine and they're great for readers and they're part of the business models that many people have now. But I don't like the exclusive one. (laughs) I think exclusivity is just, in general, annoying. So there we go. Uh, Kobo Plus now in more countries. Also this week, and this isn't really about indie authors, but I was fascinated. So the launch this week of Authors' Equity, which, as reported by Publishing Perspectives, links in the show notes as ever. So this is a new publishing company committed to reshaping the relationship between author and publisher. Yes, this is a traditional publishing company with authors in its name. Uh, as they say, it is a collaborative publishing company reshaping the relationship. And uh, the three partners are big names. The former CEO of Penguin Random House USA, Madeline McIntosh, the former CEO of Macmillan, uh, Don Weisberg, and the former president of strategic development with Penguin Random House, Nina von Moltke. So these, this is this is like a powerhouse new publisher. More interesting is that the investors in this company include James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, Tim Ferriss, obviously well-known for our work week, many books, and the Tim Ferriss podcast, and Louise Penny. So the core principles include Our profit share model rewards authors who want to bet on themselves. Profit participation is also an option for key members of the book team. So we're in a position to win together. The uh, principles also include flexibility and transparency and giving books room to breathe. We're in it from day one for the long haul. James Clear, who is to publish forthcoming books with Authors Equity, says... Authors Equity has taken the best elements of traditional publishing and combined them with a fresh approach that works perfectly for authors who want to succeed in today's market. Authors get to create books on their own terms without having to let go of the excellence in editorial skill and mainstream distribution that is a strength of traditional publishing. The publishing world has changed. We are no longer in the change is coming stage. It's here and Authors Equity is creating it. The Publishing Perspective article goes on, contrary to usual practice, Authors' Equity won't offer authors money up front or guarantee them a payment, but it will give them the lion's share of any profit. So this is really interesting. It sounds like a hybrid publisher for very successful authors who can shift books themselves. Let's face it, James Clear, uh, Atomic Habits is one of like the biggest sellers the biggest sellers self-help book of all time, I think. Uh, it is a very good book. Um, and presumably he's done so well, uh, he's sold a lot of books, but his existing arrangement with his publisher would mean he's not getting most of that money. So what he's clearly seen here is how to make more. Now, Tim Ferriss did uh, publish with Amazon APUB a while back. So again, I can see why he would potentially want to go in with this kind of model. So 
I think this is for author for big name authors who can bring a lot to the table. I don't think this is going to be like an open submission publisher that anyone can submit to, but I do find it interesting. It's going to have editorial and distribution of Trad Pub, but will have the royalty payments presumably as an indie and again no advance, which again. So this is a very very interesting model. Um Perhaps it will signal that there will be more flexible models within other traditional publishers in the future for authors who bring a lot to the table. So on direct sales, well, as discussed many times, my business model these days is far more about direct sales through Kickstarter, my two Shopify stores, and also through my Patreon. I still sell wide everywhere, but my focus is direct. And Dave Chesson at Kindlepreneur has an article this week on insights based on a survey on selling direct, which I broadly agree with. It says 44% of authors selling direct have written more than 10 books and 40% have started selling direct in the last year, which absolutely shows you how the trend is taking hold in the community. One factor emerged as critical to the success of direct sales. And yes, you guessed it. It's an email list. (laughs) So if you have books and an engaged email list, you can always sell your work. So if in doubt, concentrate on those two things, however you want to sell um, and publish, whether you want to get a traditional publishing deal, if you want to um, you know, do well on the retailers, if you want to sell direct, if you have IP, intellectual property assets, books and an email list, you're going to do better on any platform. Dave offers some tips on building an email list, but for me, it's been the same thing for 15 years. Give away something for free, like my blueprint, thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint, which uh, I recently rewrote completely. So it's the new blueprint or my free thriller at jfpen.com forward slash free. And of course, when you sell direct, what is one of the awesome things is you get the email. So I'm actually, my fiction email in particular is growing faster than ever as everyone who buys is then on the email list. So when selling direct, more authors offer print books than eBooks. Not by much, but most offer both. But it's definitely a physical market and many also offer audiobooks and merchandise. Selling direct is all about higher average order value, how much you make for each sale. So having multiple products, bundling and more can really help. So uh, in the article, it explores why authors are selling direct. The main catalysts were increasing profit by keeping more of the revenue, gaining full control and decreasing reliance on Amazon. I would also add getting paid much faster. I get paid from Shopify every single day and I really like getting paid every day (laughs) within or at least within a a day or two and also getting the customer data and uh, being able to email with customers direct and know who is buying, which of course you don't on any other store. It's definitely having uh, worth having a look at the article. And I know that not everyone wants to sell direct right now or perhaps ever because there's definitely more work involved, but it's something to consider as your author business expands. And in the meantime, keep writing, keep building your email list. So that's on Kindlepreneur and I will link to that in the show notes. In AI news pretty exciting, Anthropic released Claude 3 this week. So Anthropic is the AI company that Amazon has invested in and Claude can be accessed through their Bedrock uh, software as a service product. You can also access it through poe.com, P-O-E.com or through Claude.ai, which is how I'm using it. And this is uh, one of the paid models. Um, (laughs) And yeah, so it's like about $20 a month, something like that. Uh, It's very, very good, to be honest. Many of us think Claude is more creative, in inverted commas, than ChatGPT. And uh, I have used it to write sales descriptions for my last few books and stories with very few changes, as well as ad copy. It does a great job. Now, some parts of the new Claude 3 model uh, are considered at or above GPT-4. So um, what's interesting for us is an even bigger context window at 200,000 tokens. You could upload a book of around 150,000 as a prompt um, and ask for a sales description of that book or log lines or taglines if you're pitching for film or ad copy or suggested images for ads or a pitch email for media or anything else. Now, 
Uh, I know that some people are not comfortable uploading books into the models. Personally, I am, but that must be your um, decision. Uh, read the terms of service. I am happy to do it, um, but you must decide for yourself. Um, you can also get transcription from images. So this is actually really cool. I And you can do this on ChatGPT as well, um, but I was doing it on Claude. You can upload a, like a picture of a page of your journal that's handwritten and it will transcribe that into text, which you can then copy and paste and you've got it in text. So that and it actually does a pretty good job of my handwriting, which is a real school, like Jonathan can hardly read it. <laughs> so I I actually, this only came out like a day and a half ago and I played with it straight away. Uh, well, I played with it as soon as I got access, which I guess was a day later. I uploaded my work in progress of Spear of Destiny because I'm a, I'm a discovery writer, right? I, I don't, I'm still struggling with what the hell happens next. And I asked it for... Um, to suggest missing scenes. So the, the prompt was, so I uploaded the document um, and then I said, please suggest missing scenes in this story that would complete the open story threads and complete the character arcs. And I did not expect this to work because it, the prompt is very much a sort of editorial question of what will make this work in progress a complete book and uh it was very good it came up with i asked for 15 it gave me 15 and explained why the scenes would be a good idea in order to complete various character arcs which was all correct uh, the recall is much much better i also then explored uh, how how to improve a particular character and then i went to chat further with it expand on various deeper aspects um i also uploaded so i'm writing some scenes in the library of congress in the usa and i uploaded uh, some pictures i took in the in the library of congress and i asked it to uh, describe the scene that the setting with in my style in the same style of the document and from the perspective of my character Morgan Sierra knowing what it did about her religious and uh, her attitudes in general from the rest of the book so I'm very impressed um, I was using Claude.ai paid subscription the Opus model there are three models in this um family of Claude 3 Opus is the most intelligent it does take <laughs> like a minute or something to process. But what is also interesting is given this is so close to GPT-4 level and in some tests, and I'll link to this in the in the notes, but in some tests it is uh, performing above GPT-4, I would expect that we will see another model from OpenAI soon, maybe 4.5, in order that they stay ahead. So remember, if you've only used the free versions of these tools, it is well worth trying the paid version, even just for a month, as they are significantly better and more useful. And of course, you don't need to use them for any writing. I don't, although I don't have a problem with it. I use them more as a sidekick um, for ad copy, for, you know, brainstorming and, and all this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think if you haven't tried these sort of more professional models, you don't really understand how useful they are. <laughs> and if you're not getting good results, then you need to improve your prompting. Now, I mean, considering I've been playing with this since the moment, the day that ChatGPT was launched in 2022, I have been using these models. So um, I feel like I pretty much know how to work with them. Um, so if you're just starting out, remember that you'll need to play with it. It's a conversation. And uh, yeah, have fun. So in personal news, I am still writing the first draft of Spear of Destiny. And yes, as I mentioned, although I use AI as part of the process for brainstorming, helping with descriptions, I still write and edit my own words. I finally finished <laughs> some pretty epic scenes in Lhasa, Tibet, which were heavy on the research in terms of sense of place because I have not been there. And it is very important to me to get... Uh, true and real life description. So I had to spend a lot of time, oh, which was terrible, you know. <laughs> I do love my book research. Uh, looking at photos of Lhasa, it was in the Patala Palace, which uh, did you know that Himmler's Anna Nerbe uh, went there on a research trip in 1938 after the SS took control of the Spear of Destiny? Uh, so much interesting stuff in history. So 
those scenes are now done. <laughs> and now I get to write some scenes in Washington, D.C. as the Nazi archives, um, Hitler's library and all that are held in the Library of Congress, including the rushes, the raw material from that Tibet trip that the um, SS took. So I visited the Library of Congress last year. Uh, I've got some photos of that. And so I'm now into those scenes. The Kickstarter pre-launch page is up. You can see the cover if you want to be notified as well. jfpen.com forward slash destiny. On audiobooks, I have finally commissioned my Arcane series narrator, Veronica Jaguer, who is, yes, a human, to record the first three books in the series again. So that's Stone of Fire, Crypt of Bone, Ark of Blood. So she did them years ago, but I rewrote them in 2022. So, um, and I haven't had them redone, but I'm now going to do it because I want to offer the entire backlist of audio and the new books. So 13 audiobooks bundled as part of one of the reward tiers and an add-on on in the Kickstarter for Spear of Destiny. So um, also for my, a uh, lot of people are asking for it. Again, um, I've been doing a lot of direct sales advertising and a lot of people have asked for these audiobooks, which is fantastic. So I'm getting those done. I am also off to Seville, Sevilla, in the south of Spain, as soon as I finish this, basically. Um, but I'll be back by the time this goes out. But I'll tell you about that next time. I'm speaking on the AI assisted artisan author. This week, as this goes out, I'm going to be at London Book Fair. So it's a bit of a mad couple of weeks. I'm chairing a panel on authors and technology and the future with Orna Ross and Michael Leron. I'll be meeting up with various people, attending sessions. And for the first time, London Book Fair, which is a traditional publishing event, is doing a lot on AI, which is very interesting. It demonstrates how much generative AI is uh, penetrating and affecting the industry. So I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, hand wringing, but also there's some very interesting sessions that I'm looking forward to. If you're going to be at either Seville or London Book Fair, um, I will be around. Say hi. Um, I'm always happy for selfies, but uh, no hugs or handshakes. <laughs> I managed to avoid getting sick in Vegas by doing that. So that's my plan now. Um, if you are going to London Book Fair, wear comfortable shoes and bring an external battery to charge your phone. And that is generally a good tip for any um, conference uh, or event or trade fair, whatever. So thanks for your emails and comments this week. Gladys Strickland says, thank you, Joanna and Alex um, from Book Vault for this episode. I'm excited that there is now a US printer with Book Vault and that there are foil and end paper options coming. So many ideas for me to use with my book. And Christina A. Brunham 7117 said, this has me so fired up to design my book. I had a general idea in my head for the look of it, but now I've got so many possibilities swimming in my head. Thanks for the great content with Book Vault. I'll be re revisiting this one for sure. So please remember you can leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me. Send me pictures of where you're listening. Joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author first approach is why they built a promotions tool for you to easy, easily and affordably market your book directly to Kobo readers. There are lots of promotional opportunities for you to keep an eye out for from daily deals, percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales. You'll be sure to find something that suits your books and marketing plans. The promotional offerings are updated often, so make sure you regularly have a look to see what's on offer. And if you're taking part, be sure to tell your readers about it. So just uh, on a personal note, I go in every couple of weeks and just submit my books to every single promotion that uh, I can fit into. And uh, I don't get all of them, but I get enough of them. And this certainly drives sales and um, borrows through uh, the 
subscription program and all that and uh, there are also options for audiobooks so this is if you sell wide and you sell on Kobo this is a must must use tool if you are a KWL author as in if you go direct to Kobo and it's not there then email the team at writinglife at Kobo.com and they will switch it on so you have access to that promotions tab that's writinglife at Kobo.com also you can use that for any question they are a really friendly helpful team If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast wherever you are listening to this and find them on social media. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my community at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to the six new patrons who've joined since last week. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. As this goes out, last week I shared a video on eliminating tasks, saying no and setting boundaries, which went up in the Patreon. If you join the community, you get all that as well as all the backlist videos and audio. There's lots on a various aspects of AI, as well as access to the monthly Q&A where I answer uh, patron questions, which is like a extra solo episode a month. The Patreon is a monthly subscription, the equivalent of a black coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. So if you get value from this show and you want more, come on over and join more than a thousand authors. Join us at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. And remember, you can also access the content through the Patreon app, which has easy access to view and listen. Right, let's get into the interview. Becca Syme is an author, coach and creator of the Better Faster Academy. She is a USA Today bestselling author of Small Town Romance and Cozy Mystery and also writes the Dear Writer series of non-fiction books. So welcome back to the show, Becca. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. I love being here. Oh, no. Now, you've been on the show a few times, so we're just going to jump uh-huh. into the topics today as we've got so much to talk about. Yes, now, let's do I, it. Um, yeah, I really wanted to talk to you about some of the things I'm seeing in the community right now. And you're so wise, and I think people need help and guidance. And sometimes I'm just a little bit blunt about stuff, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have a different manner. So the first thing I want to talk about is, is a shift in the business model for indie authors. And you and I were both at the last 20 Books Vegas, the last ever one. And it feels like what used to be one clear path is splintering into all different things. So what changes are you seeing in the business models? And how is it affecting authors you coach? Yeah, the the upside, I think, of some of the changes is that we're seeing a real trend away from this expectation of as many books as you can possibly produce right? Because we've hit the saturation point basically everywhere. There are always going to be these niche genres that pop up, right, that aren't fully saturated yet, but they get to saturation point pretty quickly. And so when the whole of the industry is saturated, that changes the problems that readers have. So when readers were having a problem in 2012, of uh, there just weren't enough books Like there weren't enough books for them to choose from. And New York sort of kept it that way on purpose, right? Like they kept the water blue on purpose. And now that we don't have that problem anymore and readers have different problems, then the way you solve them as a writer is different. So it becomes more and more important to kind of find the people who are going to be your people that you're going to write for and to try to maintain some sense of, like um, having people that you are pleasing, right? Not that you have to write to market, not that you have to write for anyone but yourself. But there's we've lost this sense in the industry, I think of like, well, all you have to do is publish a book and it's going to sell, which by the way, again, I always like to remind people that still wasn't the case. Even in the gold rush, there still were plenty of books that weren't selling, but we're facing that more now than we ever have, because there are so many people who are having the experience of like, well, I came in and tried to do this model, and it's not working for me. And so now I have to think of something different. And really, the indicators are all there that the problems readers are having are different. 
So there's no more expectation. In, in my opinion, it's only grown over the last four or five years that what we're seeing are people who are writing fewer books a year who are selling more. And the faster and faster and faster you write, you have to know you can produce a product that people want to read if you're going to write that fast. Otherwise, writing that fast is not, that's not the way to go. It's funny, I'm actually, as we record this next week, I'm speaking in Seville, and I've kind of put a sort of tongue in cheek title on one of my slides, which is one book to 50k, (laughs) instead of 20 books to 50k. So you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say the the problems that readers have are always the things that dictate the market, like the way the market's going to function. And when there's too many books in the market, which obviously we're going to talk about that later on in this in the session as well. But when there's too many books in the market for readers to choose from, they have different problems, which becomes curation, right? Like, how do I find the books that are going to be the best for me to read? And so putting more and more and more books and just not caring whether they meet reader expectations, not caring whether readers want them or not. That's not the way to solve the problem of curation. The way to solve the curation problem is to write a better book and, and specifically to write a book that people will want to read. And so I, I really believe that despite all the things that are happening in the industry, that for writers who want to write books, craft is going to become more important, storytelling and pacing are going to become more important, that there's going to be this resurgence almost of like, well, okay, now the pendulum has swung all the way to one side, in terms of like, just creating anything, just to put things out in the market. And we're recognizing that that's just not what readers want from us right now, like readers want better. They want books that they want to read. And however you personally can produce that is the model. And again, I would argue that has always been the model, like the model for, uh, let's say, 20 books to 50K, right? For the people who can produce a lot of books, then that was the model. But for people who couldn't, there were still people who were only producing one, two, and three books a year, who were making a living writing, even during the gold rush. So Not like it, me. <laughs> yeah, like it's always been that way that however you can produce a book people want to read is how you should produce it. And not to pay attention to what other people are doing. But again, like, in an industry that's very competitive, it's hard to, it's hard to have that certainty about your own process. So I guess that's always what I'm hoping that I can do is to help people increase their certainty in their own process. So I guess that's one thing is the writing a lot of books is, is and especially with, we'll come back to AI, but th- there's a lot of ways to produce a lot of books very fast. So we can't compete on being a machine in terms of production. But another mm-hmm. change, I think, is that, again, the focus up until reasonably recently, I guess, was Amazon. And then, of course, there was mm-hmm. KU plus ads, that very digital first model. But then even authors who go wide were focusing very much on retailers in general, And it seems like there's also the shift into the selling direct model in different ways. So what are those other business models you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with all of those just in terms of the more reader focused that we can become, I think the more we can think about how to solve the problems that readers are actually having, the more likely we are to maintain sustainability long term. Because if what readers want is more of your world, then you giving them more of your world via something like Patreon or doing Kickstarters or something like that is going to be what will keep them invested in your platform over choosing to go to other people's platforms, right? So there's this element for me of when the world shifts, like we can't control what happens in the world. So you can either react to it or not. And when the world shifts and we move towards this, people want curation, people want more good books, people want, they want to go deeper into the things that they really like, they want more community. Like those are problems that we can solve for them 
if again, like not everybody's a community builder, I get that. But those are problems that we can solve for them. And using things that are more personal, that offer more access, that give us more control over the data is definitely, that seems to be the pendulum swing that we're in right now, for sure. Well, can I just ask you then on the psychology side, because you're really good at this stuff, and that there is a big ego shift when you move to like selling direct, like your Kickstarter, Shopify stores, Patreon, Ream, any of this stuff. There is no bestseller list. There's no measurement of no one else can see how much money you're making, which in one way is freeing. And in another way, well, no one can see your sales. Like most of my sales are now no longer tracked by any industry metric. Mm -hmm. They're kind of invisible. There's this invisibleness of selling direct, which on the one hand, as I said, is great. And on the other hand, the ego sort of is blasted by this. And a lot of people ask me this. They say, but you can't hit a bestseller list this way. So what do you say to people who are like, well, I, I need to be seen in that way? Yeah, I mean, I do think still, if you're a person who needs to be seen in that way, then and that is genuinely something that you would say, you know, I've never hit this list before, and I want to hit this list. And I would say it's fine to go ahead and do that. But just know that that is a model that's not necessarily moving forward in the future, right? Especially as a lot of places are starting to get rid of their bestseller list. Like we are not 100% sure that the USA Today list is going to last forever. We don't know what's going to happen with the New York Times list in the future. Like we don't, there's so much of that that we don't have control over. So I would say, like, it, when I coach people individually about this kind of stuff, I'm super clear, like, there are still a lot of people who would benefit from being in trad publishing. There are still a lot of people who would benefit from doing the sort of older model of like trying to hit a list, because that's something that really is a marker for them. It's something they've always wanted. But similarly to, you know, talking about other topics that we're going to talk about, there's a level of grief of, well, the, that industry doesn't exist anymore, right? Like the industry that we had in 2012, in 2014, or in 2016, that, that doesn't exist anymore. And so we can either be really frustrated by that and be caught up in this, but I need it, but I need it. Or we can shift into trying to find other ways to meet our ego needs. And just on a side note, because so much of this psychologically is, when it meets an ego need for you, is it actually meeting a beneficial need? Or are you in survival mode when you think about not getting that thing and you don't realize it? And this is part of why I'm encouraging people to read Claire Taylor's books about the Enneagram, because she deals a lot with that sub conscious fear that's underneath like what happens if I don't get what I want. And I think a lot of us are caught up in ego stroking that is not coming from, let's say, a strengths place, right? There are some strengths that do need to be seen as being successful. And that's a beneficial thing because it motivates them and makes them successful. But when it's coming from a place of fear, like I won't be okay if I can't prove to other people how much I'm selling, then that's a really different conversation from like, no, seeing those markers motivates me and helps me to compete with my peers and stuff like that. Those are two super different conversations. And if, if I'm coaching someone and it's very clear, like, this doesn't feel beneficial. This feels like a fear based thing. I usually will refer them to Claire's, uh, to Claire's book. Mm, well, Claire will be coming on the show soon. I haven't spoken to her <gasps> yet, but yay. <laughs> um, but on that, it, it, this is something I have been thinking about. I've been some uh, things happening in the community where I've been then questioning if I let this go, um, this podcast go, and I let go my desire and the status I do get from being visible in the author community. Sometimes it's very difficult, as you know, because you're in a similar situation. But sometimes mm -hmm. I just think, well, what could I just be just a writer and shut up and stop talking about it <laughs> and just, just do it. And I do question like, is this, is it coming from a place of fear? Like, could I survive that way? Or is it that I actually I I do want to be part of the community I want to help people mm -hmm. and actually this podcast does help more people than my books do <laughs> <laughs> uh, um so but it's something I struggle with all the time and I mean how do you deal with that 
Yeah, I have similar questions too, right? Like, is it coming from a beneficial place for me? And the, here's how I it, internalize it, because I know you also have futuristic as this in one of the Clifton strengths, right? Mm. So I'm constantly imagining my paths forward, and then living in that future of like, what would it feel like to exist as a writer, as a novelist in an industry where I do have so much knowledge about how this works. And I have so much context about what success and failure looks like and how to help people. Could I sit back and watch people struggle in my, because I'm never going to not be in community with writers if I'm a writer. I'm always mm. going to be at conferences. I'm always going to be talking to people. Could I sit there and watch people struggle and know that I could be helpful and not help? Like, is that possible for me to do? And when I imagine that future, I think, <laughs> no, like, I, I don't think Hell I could no. do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, what is it about my current situation that I don't like? Like, I, I've been talking a lot lately about building a house that you want to live in, in terms of like sustainability. And what I've done in my nonfiction career is I've inadvertently built a house that I can't live in, right? There's It takes too much personal connection for me. It takes too much of my time, etc. And so as a futuristic, what I'm trying to do is think about like, where is the level of energy that I'm willing to give to this business and this industry that is sustainable for me? And then how do I get from where I am now down to that place? And that's what I'm navigating currently. And then what I'll do when I get there, because I have some like metrics for my hours per month, how much time do I want to spend coaching? How much time do I want to spend writing? And how much time do I want to spend on nonfiction content? And once I get to those numbers, then I'm going to stop and reevaluate and be like, okay, is this a house I can live in in terms of if I stay in the industry and I'm less visible than I used to be, can I imagine myself forward from that place? Because I do feel like the future changes so much Mm. from different vantage points. So I may not be able to tell if I quit completely if I'm going to be okay 10 years from now, but I can tell better if I minimize what I'm doing and then pause in a year or pause in eight months and say, okay, now am I okay? And then ask that question differently at the end of 2024. Because if I were to say zero is not possible, like Mm. uh, otherwise I'd have to stop writing if I was going to do zero nonfiction work at this point. And so for me, I'm constantly thinking about if I was doing it this way for the next 10 years solid, would I be able to maintain that? And then that's kind of how I set my expectations. Yeah. And I think for both of us, so people listening know, neither of us are going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> because no. we both we both feel like we are committed. It's just some there are yeah. ups and downs in the process. But it is interesting, this future casting. And as you say, both of us have futuristic in our Clifton strengths. But a, a lot of people don't. And I feel like this splintering of the business models. I mean, I get emails every day right now, I'm sure you do, where people say, I've heard that things are, are like I can't just publish on Amazon and sell a book anymore. So what do I do? Like you're talking about Shopify and Kickstarter, but I don't have an audience or you're talking, someone's talked about Ream or Patreon or Substack or now someone's doing a trade show or whatever. And like, how do people deal with the uncertainty? And it's like you said, building for 10 years time, because that's what I say. It's like, well, if you started now on whatever path in 10 years time, you're going to be somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so which path do you want to do? But I mean, there is no one formula anymore in terms Mm -hmm. of self-publishing or marketing or any of these things. There are so many choices. So how do people deal with uncertainty around this and how can they choose the path? Yeah, that is a great question. And so I have a couple of different answers. The first is any person who cannot commit the time or feels just really insecure about doing all of the direct sales and all of the like in person events and things like that, there still is the or there still are a portion of people who are selling well with on the retailers alone, right? It's harder to do that 
it's it's much much harder to get just your ads to deliver and to just sell ebooks only and to make a living doing that but it's not that no one is doing it it's just that it's much more difficult than it's ever been before right so i would say if if you know that that's the only thing that you can handle then you want to set your expectations for okay i have got to do something to make sure that I am pleasing my audience, whether that's writing the best book for me, like making me perfectly happy, or writing to market or whatever it is that you're doing. But I have to be willing to take the lumps that come with the path that I choose. Because there's no lumpless path. There is no silver bullet. So whatever path I choose, I'm basically choosing the hard that I want to continue to replicate, right? So if it's too hard for me to imagine having enough self confidence to do direct sales, to put myself out at a trade show or something like that, then I'm choosing a different version of hard, but it's still going to be hard. And I think maybe this is I've been doing a lot of listening to athletes and actors just like interviews recently, trying to find these little snippets of conversation about things like luck and timing and hard work and talent, right? Like how, Mm. how do we balance all of the things that are necessary? And how do we increase resilience? Because if what we're expecting is that there's an easy button to hit, or there's an easy path or a path that will not be difficult, then we should not be doing this job. Because that is definitely not the case. I mean, I I don't think it was ever the case. I just think there are people who like hard work more than others. And so it seems easier for them because they really enjoy the hard work. But for those of us who don't like hard work, we have to know that the path is going to be difficult. So that's kind of the one thing I want to start off with is there are still people who can do sell on retailers only, but then you have to make the decisions that are the best for those retailers. So if you're going to go into KU, you have to make decisions that align well with KU. If you're going to be wide, you have to make decisions that align well with wide and kind of find the people who are talking about those strategies and pick one strategy and do it. And and this is the second thing I would say about the potential choosing of the path. It is so unlikely in this industry, that you're going to have success, period. Like, it's just so unlikely that you're going to hit full time author income, that there needs to be some level of resilience in that space. So that if you're going to work until you hit that, that you know that it's possible to not sell and not sell and not sell and not sell, and and then sell, right? So it's, the the commitment to just doing whatever it takes to hit that space is i think what i think that is the missing piece for an awful lot of where i'm seeing the industry going right now is that there are a lot of people who came in with the belief that it should be easy because the way that it was often talked about was how easy it was mm-hmm. um and i just think it it's never actually been easy though And I think we have to understand how much hard work is going to be involved in it. And we have to be willing to do that if what we want is that outcome. Because, of course, and I'm sure Claire will talk about this when she comes on, but not everyone should be shooting for full-time income. That's not what's going to make everyone happiest, especially because, and I talk about this from a strengths perspective a lot, especially because trying to write full time for some brain wirings is actually not beneficial because putting the amount of pressure on yourself where you're tying your stability and security to your creativity is going to make your creativity go away and it's going to become harder and harder to produce the more difficult the sales become. And so there are a lot of people in this industry who for reasons of safety and security being the number one goal, need to have at least a part time job bringing in money so that writing never becomes the thing they rely on to pay their mortgage, or they're going to eventually have 
like the creativity is going to become inaccessible because the pressure will get to be too big. And that's something we don't talk about a lot because it's not sexy. You're not going to make a class talking about how you shouldn't quit your day job. But the reality is that an awful lot of us will function better in our creativity and write better books and make more money if we don't have to rely on the books to produce our mortgage payments. Yeah, I mean, I've always talked about multiple streams of income. Yep. And I do make good money from book sales alone. But like you, I have other forms of income. This podcast is is one of them. And I like having that. It makes me feel more more secure. Um, yep. And I love how you talk about choosing the hard you want, because I also still see people are like, oh, well, you know, it's easy to self-publish. And that's what makes it like almost worthless whereas getting a traditional publishing deal is hard and it, you're completely right like being a successful indie author is just as hard just in it's a so different hard. way <laughs> yeah and yeah, so it's, it's a different funny. kind of hard <laughs> yeah and it's so funny because at the moment I some of the emails I get I'm like look I think you should just go and pitch a publisher like if you're mm-hmm. not willing to do the work around reaching readers yourself and you think a publisher will do it for you then go pitch a publisher. I mean, mm-hmm. do you find yourself saying that now? It's so weird. I oh, haven't yeah. done that for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I, I regularly still have coaching calls where I'll say to someone, I do think Trad is a better fit for you. Because mm-hmm. I think you're, especially the people who are not in a place emotionally where they can handle a lot of attention, right? Where as an indie, you have to be your own salesperson. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there are a lot of people who cannot do that for themselves because they just don't have the emotional tools for that right now. And I'm constantly saying in my, um, I have a Patreon where I write blog posts basically every once in a while. And I'm constantly saying in my Patreon, we need to increase our emotional resilience skills if we're going to remain indie because there's always going to be pain, difficulty, you're going to get into fight or flight mode about things. And if you don't have the capacity to regulate yourself like your own nervous system, then you're not going to survive in this industry because it it's so competitive. And it's so painful, even in the places where, oh, my gosh, yes, it's so supportive. And we're all talking about how supportive it is. And by the way, if you have to talk about how supportive it is, I question how supportive it is. But we're constantly (laughs) having these conversations about like, yes, there are these supportive corners. And yet, if you're talking just to individual authors, we know how difficult this job is. And people who are trying to get into this job need to understand like, I have to have emotional resilience, I have to be able to put myself out there in front of people. And that might mean there's a skill that is not being executed in my brain right now that I might have to work on, I might have to reparent myself, so that I can have a better chance at doing well at this job. And there's nothing shameful about that. That is actually really excellent self management and self leadership is knowing, you know what, I'm not great with criticism. So I'm going to go work on getting better at criticism, because I want to write better books. And right now, every time my editor sends me feedback, I get triggered so bad, I can't read the feedback and work on the book, I have to put the book away. And I'm like, great, let's work on some emotional resilience skills there then so that you can take that criticism, so that you can continue to grow and get better, because that's definitely the key long term in this industry emotional resilience and growth. Oh, so much there. Well, talking about resilience then, another big impact right now is <laughs> the discussions around generative AI. And yeah. I mean, you and I have been around this industry a while. We've dealt with some of the big waves of war within the community. I mean, there's been a number of these. There's also been some kind of real hate at different points around various people's choices and a lot of, again, splintering. I feel like it's quite a relevant word around people's attitudes around generative AI. This, I mean, my listeners are at least AI curious or AI positive. The anti-AI ones have gone away generally by <laughs> now. So we sit in between the thing, but a lot of people are going through a difficult time. We mentioned grief earlier, and I do want to come back to that because I feel like I faced some of these existential questions around AI a year or so ago. Um mm-hmm. 
And I feel like I've been through some of this and there's a recalibration of what it means to be an author, why we write, this kind of focus on craft and the process rather than the outcome. Can a machine do this better than us? I mean, these are some big questions. So how do you see people dealing with this kind of badly and how do we deal with it well? Yeah, I mean, there is so much grief around this process because, of course, so many of us grew up with these dreams of becoming, uh, having a room of one's own and writing full time, right? Like so many of us grew up with these very vivid pictures that when we hear about something like AI <clears throat> and we think about the shift in the market, or even just you hear me talk about saturation in the market and it's like, oh, there's this piece in my head that's like, am I going to have this outcome, right? And I would say, the important thing about this industry is that it goes through changes all the time. And no one is ever 100% correct about what's going to happen. And if you are sort of struggling with this, I would read the book Same as Ever by Morgan Housel. Because and, and he goes through this really brilliant example, example after example of the things that change the most are the things that surprise us. It's never the stuff that we are prepared for that is what we really need to practice resilience for. And and this is what I would say to people. The changes that we know for sure are coming in terms of like we know there are going to be splinters, right, in the industry. Okay, great. How do I make myself splinter resilient? How do I find people around myself that are going to be positive, you know, positive forces in my life relationally? How do I make connections with people? Because I can't change how other people feel or think on either side of this debate, uh, pro AI or anti AI. I can't change how people think. And I can't change how people are going to act. The only thing I can change is myself. And so I need to deal very quickly with whatever grief I'm having about whatever picture I had in my head about what the future would look like, because the faster I can get to acceptance and the faster I can recalibrate what my future could now look like, the better for me, right? So thinking about the larger industry, I think, in not from a Joanna and Becca perspective, but from like an individual author perspective. If it's not, if I can't affect change in the larger industry, then I have to be willing to deal with whatever happens, which means I have to increase my ability to do emotionally resilient things. And I have to increase my ability to feel successful no matter what happens. And I have to increase my ability to be able to pivot quickly and release the future that I thought was coming without releasing my hope for the future. Because regardless of what happens in the industry, people are always going to want want to read books. People are always going to want to write books, like people, people, not just mm. machines, but people. And so as long as I know that I'm always going to write no matter what happens, even if that means I have to get a day job to support it, even if that means that I have to change my expectations about the future in order to support it, I know I want to keep writing and fixating on whether or not I can have this very specific picture of what I think the future should look like, that's only going to make it harder for me to adapt to the industry. And it doesn't mean that I have to release any expectation of how I will feel, because that's usually what the picture is going to produce for us, right? Is the picture produces freedom, or the picture produces gratitude, or it produces security. And there are other ways to find that other than the very specific picture that I have in my head. And that's what I would say is I want us to all be as quick to accept and pivot as we can, and then as quick to provide ourselves with the needs that we have, rather than waiting for the industry to change back or waiting for the industry to catch up or wherever it is that we're feeling, we have to take agency for ourselves and be responsible for our own emotions. 
Absolutely. And it's interesting. I mean, just on terms of practical steps, I mean, I'm an input person as well. And so I do, I input a lot on all of this stuff. And even I get overwhelmed sometimes. And so my two things are I get off social media and the Mm -hmm. internet in general, go for a walk or something. And then also I write as in Mm -hmm. I create, I find joy in the process of writing. And as you said, we are writers, we write and we love creating and that's not going to stop. You know, if, if the whole world loses their jobs to AI, everyone will be on universal basic income and we'll mm-hmm. still write. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I think. It's like, OK, this is actually amazing. It could be really amazing. So just think of thinking about it that way. I mean, but I wanted to ask you about social media because you have we talked earlier about finding the people who are your people, finding readers how, but a lot of people are having to step off social media right now. So how are people meant to find readers if things are changing so much? Yeah, I would say every avenue that's open to you, I would use it as strategically as possible. So for instance, make sure that it is exceptionally clear how people get on your newsletter in every single book that you publish. Make sure that your funnel is super, super intact in terms of like, I'm not talking about the, you know, 45 steps of creating a perfect funnel. I literally just mean if someone picks your book up and they want more from you, is it easy for them to figure out how to get on your mailing list and how to get more from you? And this is maybe the bigger piece for me about longevity and sustainability is we have to be willing to build slowly if that's what it's going to take to have a long-term sustainable career. And it's possible that me getting a book bub every once in a while and me running some ads and me, you know, sort of chugging along in my book sales and then building my newsletter organically or building my community or my Patreon organically is going to be the way that I'm going to function the best because it allows me to not be as present on social media, if that's what I need to do, then what I want to make sure that I do for myself, again, I need to practice agency with my own feelings and not be and not allow myself to feel preyed upon by whatever is happening in the larger industry, because that is where the most unhappiness and ineffectiveness comes from is where I get stuck in a space where I miss the fact that I can choose to do something different. I can choose to feel different. I can choose to look at different data. I can choose to not be present in some of those groups. I can choose to not listen to some of those people who are creating a lot of fear in me. And I am the person who gets, I have agency over my own story. And that's what I want us to remember is as long as I don't quit, as long as I don't give up, there's always more possibility in the future for me to grow more, to put more books out, to have more readers, to ha- to make more money. There's always a possibility for that, but I have to be willing to do whatever it takes and not give up. Yeah, and it always it just comes back to the what we love about this process. And then, you know, like mm-hmm. we talked about earlier, you and I back away sometimes, but we come back to this because we really do love it. We love the mm-hmm. writing, we love the community. So yes, people listening, we're not going anywhere. And you've mentioned <laughs> yeah. sustainability and re- resilience a, a few times. And you've actually got this brilliant digital conference coming up. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, our goal in this, uh, we're going to do something a little different in this digital con, which is we're going to have a couple of days of presentations in the on the first weekend. It's going to be the second. I think the second week in May is when we're going to start. And then we're going to give you a week off to go and do some homework. And then we're going to come back for a day and a half on the second side. And so the conference dates are going to Look, uh, when you see the website, you'll see what I mean. But the conference dates are going to say something different. But the goal is we want to give you a chance to put some of this into practice and to go and do some of the analysis in terms of like my own stability, my own skills. What am I expecting from myself that I can't continue to produce for forever? How can I build a sustainable? It's basically the question, how do I build a house that I can live in? Mm. Right. And so the, the big question for me in this conference, and it, we call it the QTP con, I think the question, the premise con every year, but basically our goal this year is to talk about building sustainable author businesses. 
Brilliant. So where can people find that and you and your books and everything you do online? Uh, Better Faster Academy, uh, all one word, betterfasteracademy.com. And all of that should be in various places on that front page. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Becca. That was great. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I hope you found the discussion with Becca useful as we go through another wave of change as indie authors. And I certainly feel more encouraged when I talk to Becca, as like me, she is an advocate for long-term thinking and for sustainable author business. So let me know what you think of today's show. Please leave a comment on the show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. So next week, I'm talking with Claire Taylor about insights from the Enneagram and how to sustain your author career. And we do some honest analysis on me, (laughs) which is both interesting and also a little scary to talk about, but hopefully it helps. So that's coming up next week. And in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.